Hey, it's Mike here, and today, the Corona Belt, a environmental, atmospheric basis for the most intense coronavirus spread, and it happens to look a little bit like a wavy belt. I believe that I'm coining the term right now. Maybe someone else is thinking of it at the same time. Anyway, we've had a sun belt for a while, we've had a rust belt for a while, and now, why not add the Corona Belt to the list? I've had this video idea in my drafts for a while, but now that we've had a few more studies come out, I feel confident that yes, in fact, there is a very weather-based spread to this virus. That is not to say that this is the be-all, end-all way of looking at how this virus spreads. Clearly, it can spread indoors regardless of what temperature it is. But this way, we can look at high vulnerability places, maybe predict some high vulnerability cases, explain why certain places aren't getting infected that you think would be infected, and we're also gonna look at the exact virus structure and the properties that might be leading to this. Anyway, let's go. All right, let's start with those unanswered questions. Why are some of these countries that are not that far away from major infection points not really seeing an infection? And they're not practicing amazing lockdown standards either. Although India is upping their lockdown game, they have a super low amount of cases for being right next to China with super dense population. Why is that? Why is it that other major super dense cities in China didn't have booms in infection, even though they probably had the same amount of people infected traveling to those cities as were originally infected at that animal market in Wuhan? It was enough to cause tens of thousands of cases in Wuhan. Why didn't it explode in other places? And why haven't places like Africa or Mexico been hit hard? Why are the circumstances leading these countries to think about blocking travel from places like Europe and the US? Well, well, well how the turntables and a micro update yes the u.s is quickly becoming the new epicenter of this we have about 10,000 new cases every day we're at around 60,000 cases and within the next few days we'll probably become the country with the most confirmed cases maybe there were more untested cases in china but we'll have the most confirmed cases of any country certainly a part of it was the u.s disbanding the pandemic response team a couple years back as well as totally downplaying the severity of this for way too long and a widespread inaccessibility to healthcare for many, but there's more, there's more. Many states have gone into a pretty serious lockdown. Iowa, where I am, is not very locked down, but I'm practicing social distancing to be a good person. And that's why I'm wearing a collared shirt, just to, just to remind myself that I'm part of society. All right, now let's try and answer the question of why certain places were hit so much harder than others. There's been a lot of talk about temperature from the beginning of this, and we'll get into the biology of why this occurs with the virus, but we have a pretty recent preliminary paper, and they're all gonna be preliminary. They're not gonna be peer reviewed just because of the time frame here. Anyway, they state that, quote, higher average temperature was strongly associated with lower COVID-19 incidents for temperatures of one degree Celsius and higher, in other words, when you're looking at a range above freezing, higher temperatures had lower infection rates. And as Live Science reported, an MIT analysis found that 90% of infections occurred in areas that are between 37.4 and 62.6 .6 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's 3 to 17 degrees Celsius. And from another super recent study, they say that the virus is likely to be constrained from climate and they glean some lessons from SARS-1. This coronavirus is equally douchey cousin. They say that, quote, Incidences sharply decrease as temperature increased from 15 to 29 degrees Celsius, after which it practically disappeared. They also mentioned that the cooler end had 18 times more infection incidents than the higher, warmer end. And then you have humidity, and there's a very rational, physical explanation for this, but researchers have thrown out different ranges. One that seems to work pretty well is the 40 to 80% range that encompasses the spread in general. This third new study does a great job of mapping the weather basis for COVID-19 spread. One thing it looks at is humidity. This is a chart of new cases and relative humidity, and you can see they're really pretty much all between 50 and 90%. And looking at the temperature ones, you can see you really get a cutoff once you get into the 70s. But let's zoom out at the entire world map here and start by looking at temperature because obviously there's a huge connection here and you can go to climaterealyzer.org and look at the maps of temperature from the last year at least. We don't have them from this year. We can use January through April of last year to get a rough idea of what's happening, especially starting in January when all of this took off. And the result really is astounding because virtually all of the hot spot cities that have been hit hard by the virus are right along this particular temperature line. It's that sliver where that blue and green meet. To start in Wuhan where the virus started and you can see that that Southern South Korea also has the same line. And I also wanna mention fascinating, central Spain is getting hit 
reasonably hard. Look at that temperature dip. We have right in the middle from that temperature graph, that blue spot. Move west, you know, to north central Iran, then over to northern Italy, New York City, Washington. It's actually uncanny. And if you draw a red line right across that gradient, we pretty much have a line of infection and death, as brutal as it sounds. No, it's very accurate and about 80 to 90% of the world's cases happen to be on or very close to this line. But there are obviously places along this line where people didn't get infected. For example, Turkey, or at least they're not reporting it, but it might be because of something like humidity. And Turkey, it appears in Istanbul where a lot of people are, there's super humid nights and that might just sort of cleanse it. I don't know. And Weather Underground has really good records of this. And to contrast that, we can look to, say, Wuhan in January. January 1st was, you know, around 43 degrees in general, and the humidity was 56 to 80% in general through the day. So ideal conditions. It's no surprise that this is what the virus likes as well, because this is where it evolved. It evolved to thrive in these conditions. You know, it evolved probably in the wet markets and the farms where people were breeding these wild animals to sell for meat. Thankfully, it is now illegal to farm and sell and eat these animals, which is very obvious to the Chinese who have made it into law, yet people still kind of want to deny it in the West sometimes, which is ridiculous. And then looking to New York again, which is pretty much the epicenter right now. You know, looking to the 20th of this month, we see a perfect temperature and humidity range midday for the virus to be spreading and a ton of people, obviously. And then another one that I haven't seen any recent studies on, but who knows, maybe we'll get some, is ultraviolet radiation, that UV radiation, which can degrade the virus. And looking to the global maps in, say, January, it's very obvious that there's mild UV radiation across you know, pretty much every city that has a large-scale infection. So using all these factors, I've made a rough graphical representation of the Corona Belt, the official belt and we have it sort of fading into transparency or thinner in areas that didn't really see much effect or have higher humidity or just not that many people. But then I put little hot spots for all of the cities that have been hit hard. You know, we got Wuhan, Northern Iran, Italy. And you might be thinking, wait, shouldn't there be another belt somewhere in the Southern hemisphere? Well, no, here is a chart of January and man, it is just nowhere to be found way down there by Antarctica. All right, now let's get into the virus structure and why all of these factors play a role. So we have that circular shell that has those protein spikes on it and inside is the DNA. And here's the important part with temperature. That wall is actually made of a lipid bilayer, so it's fatty. And for example, when you are washing your hands with soap and destroying the virus, it's ripping that oily wall apart. And as it gets warmer, this wall gets softer and can more easily break and degrade. And then of course, when it gets colder, the shell remains hard and intact and it can more easily spread. And this reminds me a bit of coconut oil, which I recently described as being over because it's not healthy for your heart. Anyway, of course it is solid until it reaches about 76 degrees where it melts. So basically this is the coconut oil virus. I'm joking, but the next information we need to know is at what temperature for what period of time does the virus break down? And for example, we know Allegedly that it can survive for 17 days in a sealed cabin on a cruise ship, but it's only, you know, between 24 and 48 hours at 68 degrees for various materials. Because the real question here is, is that temperature of a city going to allow those little virus shells to stay intact when it's hanging out on the door handles of the outsides of buildings and cars or railings that are all over the place or public transportation and so on? Because the longer it survives on a railing, obviously the more infectious it's gonna be, the higher the infection rate is gonna be for every hand that goes over that railing all day long, walking down to the subway or wherever they're going. So you just gotta spank the virus. <laughs> But I cannot stress this enough, regardless of the temperature, the climate outside, this virus is still gonna do pretty well indoors in general. You can be living in a volcano inside of some air conditioned laboratory and still be infecting people. It just takes one infected person to walk into a nursing home or an apartment complex with a bunch of people or a hospital and so forth. And the WHO echoes this sentiment with quote, from the evidence so far, the COVID-19 virus may be transmitted in all areas, including areas with hot and humid weather, regardless of climate, adopt protective measures. And now for why humidity might prevent the spread of this infection. We've known this about so many viruses and the flu and so forth. And a lot of that has to do with just, if you're to cough, how far is that projectile gonna go? 
and the more humidity in the air, the more likely it is to quickly drop down to the ground and not infect anybody. It's kind of like if you're shooting a bullet at a target that's in the air or swimming through the water, like those action movies where the bullets go like, Pew! through the water, you know what I'm talking about. As Live Science also reported, physicist Saviz Safarian mentioned that coronavirus spreads similarly to the influenza virus as small mucus droplets suspended in the air. And that the physics of how the droplets evolve in different temperatures and humidity conditions affect how infectious it is. And now a quick look to the future and where this corona belt might strike next. Well, we can look to April and the previous temperatures and it seems like it's gonna shift upwards as you'd expect. You know, Canada may be more vulnerable. Chicago might be, you know, Salt Lake City. Maybe Beijing even could be a bit more vulnerable. Scandinavia. And then in May, all of a sudden, Chile becomes super vulnerable. You know, maybe it'll be okay because of UV at high elevation in the Andes. I don't know. And then the UV index in general is just gonna shift up there and then scorch and hopefully be a major disadvantage for the virus. Anyway, zooming out in conclusion, it's clear that there is a climatic, weather-based, atmospheric pattern, whatever you wanna call it, this temperature, this humidity, this UV is probably having an effect, especially temperature and humidity. We can chart that temperature line right across all of the major infection zones. I would go as far as to say that weather channels and weather reporting sites should create a coronavirus index. They can call it the corona belt if they want to, in terms of where this thing is going, where it's shifting, if there's a particular day where the conditions are super good, it's perfect humidity and temperature and everything for the spread, people should know about it and be extra careful and practice extra social distancing. Like maybe you shouldn't go out and buy those five giant containers of toilet paper today because the conditions are super bad. I think, I think that can wait until tomorrow. Sharon. And then again, weather conditions just don't matter if you're spreading this thing inside. So whether you're in Antarctica, whether you're in Central Africa, this could still be spread indoors. And finally, this was an animal-based disease. It was because people wanted to eat these wild animals largely as a delicacy. And if we wanna prevent the next pandemic, we're gonna have to change the way we eat. We can't keep eating animals like we are. The next pandemic will probably come from a place where I live, like Iowa, where we have more pigs than people and more pigs than any other state. It probably is gonna be a swine flu. Who knows? Anyway, I'm done ranting. Let me know what you guys think about this coronavirus idea. Let me know if you wanna see like a what I eat in a day lockdown edition, or if you want me to respond to all this flack that Earthling Ed got for saying that this is a result of an animal-based system. USA Today totally tried to slam him on it. That's it for today. Feel free to like, subscribe, share this video if you think it's an interesting idea that people should know about. Feel free to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and hopefully my next video won't be about the coronavirus, but we'll see. <laughs>